described as one of great intensity, which is right for then. This morning we're going to not be quite so intense, but equally alert and get as much from it. But I want you to naturally, those of you who were there last night and the rest of you too, to simply relax this morning and think easily along with what we're going to talk about. And it will be just as valuable as a situation where, where there's more intensity in it. But this morning happens to be a time when we're going to just sit back and relax and absorb things. At the same time, working very hard on ourselves. Because what we're going to talk about is quite profound, quite deep. And we have to put so many pieces into the puzzle. Let's see how many we can get together into this in order to understand. And you will not understand immediately. You, your surface mind can grasp it. But it's much more than you can imagine it is because words can't convey what we're going to go into. So with, with that introduction, I want to tell you that there is no need to go under, you, and you'll see what I mean, there is no need to go under in any circumstance of your life, whatever. Now, do you, do you understand what it means by going under? And it, it's very simple. Any negative mood, any angry response, anything that shakes you inwardly means that you have met a circumstance, even, a, even your own thought, you have met it and you have gone under. That is, it has conquered you. You understand that whenever you're bitter, you have been defeated, you have gone under some circumstance. You lose your health, you lose your money, you lose your wife, you lose your husband, you lose your reputation, which is phony anyway. All reputations are phony. They have no meaning at all but we trade on reputations and become each other's slaves. When you understand that there is really no entity here to either conquer or be defeated, then you no longer go under, that is, fall under the hypnotic spell of that other person of the television news cast of your wife or husband or of your own thought when you understand that there is really no one there to respond to what you call a challenge or what you call a tough situation or what you call persecution or what you call other people treating you wrongly There is no one there to be defeated. To understand this, we have to now go even deeper than this. We have to see that there's no one who can fight the situation, and there's no situation to fight. It's all over. When I have come to the end of the idea of how you should treat me, of how I should behave. I have to learn how to behave on the everyday level of taking care of the house. I don't have to take any thought for tomorrow as to how I'm going to be tomorrow. If I do that, I will meet tomorrow with tension instead of taking no thought for tomorrow. Now we will see, and now I want you to pay a special attention from this point on, a special attention, to see the great underground terror in which all of humanity, including us, if we have not found ourselves, lives. The great terror. 
Now, now follow. This is the heart of what we're going to talk about. And you, you won't you won't understand this, but you're starting. And you can take this home with you and think about it. The great terror is to see, and I'll explain it, I'll explain it, so just take it one step at a time. The great terror is to see that the game might come to an end. Do you have any glimpse at all of the fact that you're in a gigantic game? No, you don't. You don't. When an exterior event does not match my desire and I get depressed, anxious, bitter, hateful, revengeful, it is because I have sensed that the demand was a phony game, but I have not collected enough knowledge, enough insight, enough inner strength to react properly to the challenge. So fearful are we of self-exposure, of the game, and we'll, I'll explain it, of the game that we're playing on ourselves, that I fight instantly that is there is no break between the challenge of what happens to me out there and my response to it I'm unable to break it because all I have known is mechanical response to an outer challenge very very few human beings on the face of this earth ever find their way out. You understand? And I don't know how rough this sounds, but it's a fact. Very, very human beings ever do it. As Christ himself said, many are called, few are chosen. Because to begin to suspect the game that I am someone who can achieve something in this world, or I am someone who must be liked and appreciated by you, if I ever begin to suspect that the whole thing is a false game designed to keep a false concept in place, the concept of all my labels, Tom Smith, the success, or whatever, if I ever begin to suspect that it is a game which I'm punishing myself with, I will absolutely refuse to face it. First place, no one has ever told me that it's not necessary to go under. Secondly, secondly, the thing that terrifies me most of all, and you most of all, and everyone in that, out in that world most of all, is the idea that it is a game, and therefore, in order to see through the game and put an end to it, I must put an end to me, because I am the game. Anytime you or I get angry, it is because we refuse to see through the falsehood of me that I've labeled as me, and I don't want to come to an end to it because I fear death. Physical death is part of it, but then that has no meaning once I understand what it means to die psychologically. You put all these together and it's a, a great experience to see it at once so that you die now. Die to what? What has been your experiences in the last 48 hours with other people? Have you ever watched yourself in action to see where you absolutely insist on keeping the game going? What was your response when someone didn't treat you as you thought they should have or said something? Or you were caught out of a role? Have you ever been caught out of a role? It's very embarrassing, isn't it? If we weren't playing the role, 
Could we be afraid of being caught out of it? What a, what a terrible thing it is to have to get up in the morning and get with those other businessmen or with that social occasion or with anyone for that matter and play the game. The question here this morning is, can I collect sufficient knowledge about the game in order to end it? The question is, am I sick and tired of suffering by being me so that I will put an intensity into the search, into acquiring the necessary knowledge to understand everything I've talked about up until now. Do I want it or don't, don't I? That's the whole question. Either you want it or you don't. Most people don't. None of your friends will want this. Don't, don't expect them to. See, when any of us are playing a role, which is the game, and which puts us under the situation, we're completely unaware of doing it. We're not at all conscious that I said what I said because I thought it might make a good impression or I thought it might defend me a little bit or because I was afraid of the silence in the room. Can I begin to detect where I'm merely repeating this awful stage performance that I've been going through all my life, which I picked up from Mama and Papa, partly, because they were phony too, and they suffered too. I'm not criticizing them. They, they suffered just as, just as you are suffering here. You understand you're all suffering people? Do you understand that? Do you understand? Maybe I'd better tell you. Maybe I'd better tell you that you suffer 50 times as much as you know you do. I've talked with several of you, I'm speaking personally now, I've talked with several of you this morning and I saw your anxiety and I saw your tension and I saw that you, you really, really don't know what to do with your life. When there is no role at all because you've become conscious of it and have dropped it through long and hard work, then the question of what to do with your life doesn't arise anymore. There's no one there to do anything with, which does not mean non-existence at all. It means an entirely different state which you can live. So, that if a challenge comes from the outer world, which comes a, a, a thousand times a day in one form or another, something that would make you impatient, you don't fall into the mechanical reaction of reacting, or, and this is terrible, isn't it? You'll agree with this. Or of suppressing the negative reaction because you know it's not acceptable to your own image or to the other person who expects you to behave nicely because that other person, having playing a, a false game with himself, expects you to play the game with him. And so you play the game, or I play the game of smiling, of being pleasant, and I don't feel it at all, which puts me in conflict. We, we don't know what to do with ourselves, do we? This morning, right here, this morning, you're finding out how to be a new kind of human being, not, not in what you'd call the uh, ordinary religious sense, but in a very real way so that your life, your life is new. And so all the unconscious prides of having money or of being poor, and they're both the same thing, by the way, pride is pride, or of having a, what, good-looking wife, good-looking husband, or of generally having it made because you've got your pension, you've got your good position, 
as if as if any of these things push back the anxiety. Wouldn't it be a marvelous thing to be able to enter a room full of people, regardless of whether you're, you're unpretty, regardless of whether you weigh 300 pounds or 80 pounds, regardless of whether you're a flop financially or a millionaire, regardless of your physical appearance of anything else, wouldn't it be marvelous to enter the room, listen, so in command of yourself that you're not entering that room with that tense little guarded expression on your face as you talk to this man or this lady, and you're sitting back there seeing seeing something instead of unconsciously trying to make a good impression or wanting them to like you why do you want anyone to like you why do you care whether people approve of you or not whether they like you the reason is because this package of phony ideas and ideals about ourselves is at stake and above all we falsely think I must protect this package from falling apart and the only way I can think to do this is to play games with you to continue the game no wonder at the end of a day I'm exhausted and fear tomorrow because I, 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 I don't want to repeat the same stage role but I don't know anything else to do the answer is if I will become 20 times 50 times listen to this now listen <coughs> if I will become 100 times more scared than I presently see myself to be if I can become a hundred times more scared without putting a judgment on this terror oh no this uh, being afraid is not strong enough see may I tell you something I know I know that all of you are terrified human beings I know this you're not just scared you're terrified I know that under the proper breakdown of external conditions you could fall apart in tears and wailing and heartache aren't you glad to hear that aren't you glad to know that you are seen through because if I help you to see through yourself then you can eventually do it for yourself to come to this point of being 100 times more terrified than you know that you are which is the way out of it how many times have we said in our classes that any avoidance any avoidance of hell I'm using a figure of speech any avoidance of hell will keep you out of the heaven which you can reach so by living in any ideas and ideals of myself as being a person who has it made oh I have my little fright so who are you trying to kid again I know how you could break down under the proper circumstances in this group in this these classes <clears throat> we're deliberately entering the hell of seeing how much worse off we are internally than we can possibly imagine I am telling you you don't know how badly off you are this is good to see it to understand this as the step of descending down descending into the self hell which is the actual condition in order to destroy it how are you going to put out a fire unless you to use a figure of speech how are you going to put out a fire unless you get close to it with a hose 
what we do and what the vast majority of human beings do is they see the fire and then say there is no fire there at all or someone else will put it out for me which is a form of evade is if someone else can put out your fire my fire I have to do it all by myself with help okay? so one of the steps is cease to depend on anyone anyone who's supposed to be an authority in these things or depending on an exciting event of tomorrow well I'll get by today all right because tomorrow there's the big exciting sports event or tomorrow I'm getting married or tomorrow I'm getting unmarried and I'll meet a nicer man or woman all of which is self-deception a major purpose of these classes is to assist us to face the fact that under proper circumstances proper circumstances I could fall apart no particular problem here this morning everything is fine this morning uh, we're not being disliked by anyone uh, circumstances are okay while we're sitting here now never mind that What's going to happen tomorrow that can touch you even in a small way? That if you were to work on yourselves in these classes, then tomorrow nothing can touch you because there's no one there to be touched by anything. Look, I said anything. I said anything. And in this state, there is no dependency on anything anyone at all on anything at all because where there's the dependency there is you depending on that nice wife nice husband something may happen to that marriage uh, next year two years from now depending on the fact that uh, everything is going pretty smoothly and all the time there's the deep underground terror of it not going smoothly. I will ask you a question. Try to answer it to yourself. Why, why are you afraid of anyone on earth? You are, you understand? You are afraid of people another another venture into it why are you afraid of any future circumstance whatever including your own future ill health maybe or the loss of what you call valuable why well, why do you do it why do you live this way when it's not necessary why can't you say I'm going to study all these things that we're talking about, be with other people who are interested in it, so that I can go as fast as I can in breaking down this hell in which I unconsciously live, which is a fact. You understand, all of you, no exceptions, you're all living in hell. Do you know? You know, you know one form of hell? Planning for tomorrow that you'll be happier or better off when this or that changes. Which means an avoidance of the fact that I am thinking right now that tomorrow can do something for me, which it can't. I am either whole, W-H-O-L-E, whole right now in this room or I am not if I could see all this at once I could put an end to the tricky little game the frightening game right here right in this room right now and could walk it out of that door a totally different kind of human being person who can walk out without any thought of what's going to happen to me psychologically we know we have to do certain things on the everyday level 
Will you, therefore, as best you can, and stick with it, if you don't persist, forget it. You, you're not going to make it. I must tell you, you're not going to make it unless you persist hard in this. Are you willing to every day descend? You understand you get to heaven by going through hell. Can you descend into hell, which is unconscious? If it was conscious, it wouldn't be hell to a contradiction. All hell is unconscious, so you don't even know what you have to get into. This is why, at the start, it becomes very baffling to us, because we say, I thought things were going to get better. Many of you who have gone into this find out that they get worse, which is, which is a great shock at the beginning, because we've been conditioned to believe that when we went to church, for example, we were told that if we prayed, and gave our money and attended weekly prayer meeting services that God would make things better. So this has been our habitual assumption, a false assumption, toward what would happen to us. So we run into the additional shock of seeing that things get worse instead of better. But when they get worse, that is getting better because we're no longer avoiding the fact of our inner state. Then an entirely new experience occurs. And some of you, I'm sure, have experienced this in small ways, which is simply this. Instead of shaking unconsciously, you begin to shake consciously so that you know you're shaking. And then it becomes quite clear to you what we've been talking about this morning, that we are indeed, are indeed in a far worse hell than we ever thought we were. The shock is incredible, and that very shock is the thing that shocks us awake. All of you know people, maybe your own wife or husband, parents, uh, friends, people you work with. When you talk with them, someone you work with, say, your mind is working, and when you're talking to this individual, you know that certain things could help this other person if you could say them. You know very well you can't say to them what might be said that would help them, even on the everyday level, maybe in their business or something like that, because you have associated with them long enough to know that they're very touchy, very defensive, and you know far better than to open your mouth and try to correct them, even, even if it be for their benefit in some way at all. So see, we do sense how bad the human situation is. Can I turn the attention back and see how... Uh, I, there are no words. I, there are no words in the language to express this strongly enough. Can I look and see what a total hell my life is? Can I take that step by step as a means to correcting it, to getting rid of the nonsense. See, things have to be done in a proper order, in proper stages. To say that tomorrow I'm going to be happy is completely wrong. There are many things wrong with it. For example, you have time involved with it. If I can start to say very honestly, what is my life like right now? And I'll give you a clue how to do that properly. <clears throat> think of something that you're depending on what is it your health the fact that you, maybe you're still middle age and still have a good sex life not bad for that and all that uh, you have a, a wife you have a husband your income is great I will ask you if you lost this particular person or circumstance that you're depending on how would you feel then Or do it, do it, don't lie about it. Don't tell lies about it. You should be able to live so that when you lose this other person, in any way at all, he or she wants to walk off, anyway, death, anyway, you are still an independent human being, independent of the circumstance, because there is no person there depending on it this outer circumstance to keep it feeling comfortable and secure. 
you had better pray for the day. And some of you have had it. You had better pray for the day when you meet such a shocking experience that it shocks the nonsense and shocks the game out of you once and for all. You're sitting here right now, not believing. No, not, not, not really, not really. You're not really believing that under the proper loss, you would break down. Oh, you wouldn't cry in public, especially men. They're supposed to be strong. You're not believing at all how you would fall apart, how all the pretenses would vanish, all the so-called strength which is phony would be reduced to tears and heartache and bitterness and hatred against life and against God for what they've done to you. Ha! Huh. Anytime you say, what have you done to me, you had better look and see what you have done to life and how you've treated your wife and your husband. You had better take a look and see what you've done to people how vicious you have been, how cruel. That would be a very nice hell for any of us to enter. Maybe that could shock it out of us. So that we become consciously, so that we become aware of the actual nothingness of our strength of our securities. This isn't a talk. This isn't a lecture. So we become conscious that we have nothing at all. So, maybe for the first time in my life, I cry and I scream and I holler and I hate but at the same time, because I've paid attention to what I've learned here, look, it's, 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 it's astonishing. At the same time, I'm screaming against what you did to me, which I was doing to you, by the way, or I wouldn't be in the position, right? I scream what you did to me, what the government did to me, what life has done to me. There's a part of me that is watching the screaming instead of being totally identified with it. That is the beginning of real mental health. Because up till now, and 99% of my protests against life and my screaming has been done secretly. I can't do it outwardly because there'd be too many disadvantages there, especially to my images of being a person who's under control. I, I want you to think, uh, use your memory deliberately this time, and I want you to think of someone that you know, and you all know them, every one of you. I want you to think of someone, perhaps a relative, uh, someone you know, who at one time you thought was strong and authoritative and had their life under command. Now, you, do you remember what happened to that person? Do you remember how he became an alcoholic and he cried and she suddenly changed the expression on her face so that you didn't recognize her anymore because something came up? that turned her into a very outwardly bitter woman. Remember that person, huh? Who broke down? You remember. Now, can I see that I'm in exactly that same state myself? That I have, now you listen to this, that I have all this violence in me. You are all violent people, every one of you. Every single one of you, you're loaded with violence. If you are afraid, you are loaded with violence. If you are confused, you are loaded with violence. If you are bitter, you are loaded with violence. If you think you love someone, you are loaded with violence. If you want to become someone, you are loaded with violence. If you are pretending, you are loaded with violence. And 
And the only reason it does not show itself outwardly is simply because the lack of accidental circumstances in which you could behave badly outward violently while doing it in the name of God or in the name of a cause. You think you're sitting here absorbing this. Let me put you in a foreign country where no one else that you know is there. You're off in Afghanistan and you're making your living there and you meet a good-looking man or a good-looking woman and you have an affair with him or her. You take advantage of someone in business. This is violence and you would do it too. And if you didn't do it simply because you think you have a moral code is simply because you're trying to live up to a false image of yourself. How do you behave when you have the opportunity to do something cruel without being found out? That's what you really like. You think you have a morality, you have none at all. You're too desperate to have a morality. You're too eager to get a thrill of meeting that new person, having that new sex experience. Oh, if I was just young again. Oh, well, maybe I'm 40 or 50. Maybe, maybe I can get three days of it or six weeks of it. Don't you see how scared you are? Don't you see what you're doing to the world? And you have a conscience, you have none at all. What on earth are you doing to yourself? Because that is what you do to me, what you do to him, what you do to her. Now, now, if you have gone this far and if you're willing to go this far into descending into yourself, never be afraid of hell. I'm telling you, to be fearful of hell is what keeps it going. To be afraid of this hell which is you is what keeps it going. Fear, hell, one thing. Therefore, when you react with fear to seeing how terrible you are, which you are, you have no conscience at all. When you see how terrible you are and you are afraid of it or you resist it, you keep it going. Because then there is you, the fearful person, who is afraid that you're not this nice person mama and the church told you to be, as if they knew what they're talking about just to begin with. Who's the individual trying to be nice? If you would stop trying to be nice, you would be. If you would stop trying to be moral, you would be. As long as there's someone to make an effort to be good, there is the maker of effort, and there is someone there trying to be good, and you will never succeed. But if you come to the end of making an effort, absolute end to it, what is left? Nothing is left. And nothing is conscience. You can't have a conscience. There is only conscience. But you are the one conscience. His and mine are the same. His and hers are the same. So, can you understand that to react with anxiety over how bad we are keeps us as bad as we are. What do I do then? I see it and I drop the idea. I drop the thought that I am evil. That keeps me evil. Every time you say I am sick, that keeps you sick. Every time you say I must become a, a good person, that keeps you ungood. When I finally go through all this hard work and see that all the labels, all the self-descriptions, all the thoughts about what I, must, what I must do must come to an end, when I see it, when I understand, then thought comes to an end by itself and so do I. Because I don't exist outside of my own self-descriptions. I have no existence at all which is my freedom, which is not my fear. I am afraid 
because I want to keep the game going, the self game. I'm the great teacher, you're the great businessman, you're the great spiritual student, you're the faithful wife, the faithful husband. All these are prides and vanities. And I will, I will say it once more. I just wonder, I wonder how you would behave if no one was watching you behave. If your wife didn't see you off in another country, or your husband didn't. Let's take our break. All right, we had many things to say, to talk about, to think about. Now let's discuss them. What would you like to talk about? Yes? I have a question, though. The idea that we, you said we suspect that it's a game. Which is yes, we suspect. Right, you call it the self -game. And then back here, you, in the beginning, you, you made reference to the idea that if we or I can collect sufficient knowledge about the game, then we can begin to end it. Uh -huh. Would you go into yeah. the type of knowledge? Yeah. Very, very good. To collect knowledge about the game simply, in its simplest explanation, simply means to see that it is a game. And I'll tell you how you see that it is a game. By seeing that you can never win. You can never win. So you get the beautiful wife, the good-looking husband, the big promotion. So you're nice and uh, young and slender and you've got a new hairdo. We never see that it does nothing for the fact that when I, just before I fall asleep, I'm scared. We don't see him driving the car down to seek employment or to go down to uh, some government building of some kind. I never, never turn my attention on myself to see how scared I am, how uncertain, how I think, well, I'll handle it this way. No, I better handle it that way, that I can never find an answer. I have to see the game as a game and that my own lack of understanding of it as a game is what keeps it going. If I can see through myself to see that there's no answer on the level of the game, then have the courage to give up the person who thinks he can find an answer, which is absolutely horrifying because that means the end of this great clever man who knows the answers to life, which is phony. There is an answer. There is an answer to life. There's an answer to every problem any one of us have ever had. An absolute perfect answer to it, which comes when I, as the seeker of an answer, cease to seek it. Because the seeker of the answer is on the level of the so-called answer, which does nothing even when I get it. Answers on the level of thought do nothing to reduce my anxiety. So I win the, the lawsuit. So I win the, the woman. So I win, win the compliment. I get the thrill, and I'm right back where I started. And this is way, the way my whole life, right? My whole life has unfolded up until now. We are here today to see that it has never worked and will never work. Therefore, I have to go in an entirely different direction, no matter how badly it frightens me. And the only thing I'm doing is making this fear conscious, which will eventually destroy it. See? We're not getting worse. We always were worse. We always were that way. We always did have these little tricky deals by which we're going to get it made, and they never worked. 
And as an aid to me seeing through my phoniness, I can see through yours, see, vice versa. It is perfectly permissible to see what a phony that other person is. At the same time, I see what a phony I am. Then we see how we're all on the same level playing the same phony game. Then, then when you begin to end the game in yourself, it's not going to change that other person out there. He's going to continue to play it because he hasn't come to it. He has not come to a meeting like this and has seen through the, the terror of his life. Look, do you think a man, do you think a man who's making I don't know, wages are so high these days. Do you think a man making four or five hundred dollars a week who has an exciting hobby on his weekend and he has his security of a home and he has his, what he calls his philosophy or religion, do you think you're going to be interested in, in these things? Why interest a man in hell, which is what we're talking about, when he thinks he's already in heaven? Not nothing thousand years will you ever convince him that he's living a phony life, an artificial heaven. That man, that man is going to be in a circumstance someday. It might be when he's real old, it might be tomorrow, when he's going to do just what we talked about. He's going to go under. He's going to break down. He's still capable of his world. He's still capable of having his world collapse on him because he's living in this false artificial world which can collapse. You see, the real world can't collapse. Only my mental one can collapse. And if by accidental circumstances this man who's making all this money, who hasn't made and all that, if he does not run into a severe crisis, if his life by accidental factors continues along as it's going, then he simply grows older in his unconscious hell always frightened, always fighting, always having his opinion about the opposite political party, and he will simply die an unawakened human being as he lived. Can, can I create my own crisis today, now, instead of waiting for some accidental factor to come along? If I can do it now by studying myself, by getting this knowledge, then I can meet the crisis right this second, today. Then when the crisis comes tomorrow, it won't be a crisis to me at all because I've destroyed it before it came, before it happened to me. There'll be no crisis. There's no one there to have a crisis. There's no one there to cry anymore. You cry, don't you? You do. You do. And then the minute you're through crying, you know what else you do? You're furious. Because tears and fury are the very same thing. No different. Just a simple expression of the mouth. That's the only difference. If you cry, you're, you have fury in you. You have rage in you. And if you have rage, you cry. It was a long answer. Sit quietly and let life come to you without forcing it and see what happens. Now, be efficient in your business affairs. Take care of your home and your garden and do your work. Practice letting life come to you instead of trying to make it happen, as if you can make it happen anyway. It happens. Life happens. And when I am in right relationship to it, then it happens rightly to me regardless of what happens. Because then there's nothing in me opposed to what happens. Which means that I have to come to the end of me as a fighter. If you want to fight, you can fight, and you will suffer the misery of being a fighter. As we all well know by past experience. Why do you have to convince yourself of anything at all? Why do you have to prove anything about yourself at all? Why? Why? Why do you prove anything? You say you're not doing it? Your very facial expression is doing it. Your manner of gesturing is doing it. The way you behave toward others is doing it. 
Aren't you glad the whole thing can come to an end? Aren't you glad that you're at a place in a meeting where these things can be learned so that you don't have to continue as part of the madness Don't you begin to suspect, a little bit at least, that all the people who told you they had the answers, that they didn't have them at all? All these authorities and people who told you, well, if we just do this, that would end the problem. The problem continues. The crime, the violence, the lies, the wars. What, what are you going to do then? You, you have no one to turn to, do you? If the mind was operating properly, you would never turn to anyone because you would understand. You would be your own authority of your real nature, not of this phony nature who thinks it knows the answer. And which, which always has to keep up the stage performance. And oh boy, I hope I don't forget the script. Or I hope I don't move to the left when I should have moved to the right. Because if I do, you'll see through me. And I'll be so ashamed. Why don't you be ashamed sometime and let somebody catch you out of your role so as to put an end to the role, so as to put an end to the pain, so as to put, put an end to the fear that maybe you won't get applauded after the performance, that the audience will just get up and walk out on you. Why don't you let them get up and walk out on you? Which they will do when you stop playing the role because they want someone on stage so that they can have their turn. Get out of the theater altogether. Then you don't have to go by a rehearsed role script anymore. And you don't have to put on the costume anymore, which fits terribly. Oh, it's an awful fit. It's so uncomfortable. Then you can sit quietly, living fully. Whether it's silent or whether there's a lot of talk going on, you're okay, it's okay, everything's fine. You are in command of yourself and that's the whole world. That is your whole world now. Before you were you, you had about 50 worlds, and they, it gets very confusing to wonder which one you're supposed to be in at this particular moment. When you're in the one world of yourself, which is not different from his world or his world, when you're in this one world, is there anything to remember? There's something to be without effort. Without trying to keep it in place. Without trying to make the world go the way you think it should go. I want this and I want that, and by the law of accident, I get what I want about half the time, and that nothing has happened for the good outside of the simple, temporary, false thrill. And even then I knew the thrill was wrong, because I knew it would pass away. Now I have to go through the same thing again. Tomorrow I have to do it again. There's a way to put an end to all this which is why we're here working on ourselves. Why are you so easily influenced? Because, yeah, just a second, because you are not you are not, in fact, living in this one world, capital O, capital W, in this one world, which is the real world. So anyone who comes along can tell you something and you're so desperate you'll believe it. Well, if you'll get a, a boat, then you'll be happy. If you follow this philosophy, then you'll be happy. It never has worked. Go ahead. Why am I so easily influenced? Because from very early childhood, I had it thought very hard that everybody was my authority. 
everybody, my parents, the teachers, the minister, the policeman, the president, everybody was my authority, which I now see, I assumed, as false right. authority. And I was told, you must do this. That is a human being. That is the way you will live. And I believed it at the time. I do not at this time. Did it work for you to follow what other people told you? Be sick. Why do you let anybody tell you what is right for you? Repeat. Why do you let anybody tell you what is right for you? Why do you abdicate your own brain, which God gave you to use? Why do you turn it over to another person? to an organization. Why? Don't, don't, you, don't you understand that you really do have, as a small part which can grow large and complete, don't you understand, each one of you, that you do have a center in you that is capable of being developed, that becoming light, so that you can be your own authority, your own government. And then the influences of other people will be a thing of the past. Do you, can you remember situations, and I'm sure we all can, where someone told you one thing and you said, hey, this is it. <laughs> and 10 minutes later, someone else came along and told you the exact opposite. And then you were in a stage of doubt so you had to make your choice, which one seemed to give you the most security. Uh, see, we're not thinking from ourselves at all. We're influenced by the last person who talks to us, usually. On the other hand, some people get so hardened, a block, steel block hardened in their opinions. That is the same thing as being influenced because your, your influences from the past have sim simply hardened so that you now think that that is you. Oh, and what, what suffering we have to go through, conscious suffering we have to go through to melt this block. This is why it's important for each one of us to start right now, right today in this class, to start melting our hardened opinions. Because you take your opinion as being you. Why do you think anyone defends an opinion at all? Because they're self identity is involved in it. I am a member of this group or this political party. I am a person of high moral standards. On and on and on. All of which are false because it's a word, merely a word. And the word is not the state. I think it's a uh, what a tremendous thing it is to know that I can actually come back to being myself so that I can think for myself and not let other people influence me in any way at all. Then I'll see life and society as it really is. I used to see it from the viewpoint of my own desire to conquer, to be someone. Now I saw the hell of that. Now I've become, come to call my own man, my own woman. And I won't try to convert you at all. Because I know that you don't want it. I'm speaking if you're talking to other people about it. This is one of the things we learn. The world doesn't want it. It's nothing to do with what you're hearing here today. I'll ask you, do you want anything to do with it? You have to make the choice. Do you want anything to do with what we're talking about? Or do you already have the answers? Maybe you already have the answers, you think, which you don't, and you know it. There's no other way out but this. The truth will pull way out. For heaven's sake, we've tried absolutely everything, haven't we? We've tried everything, and it hasn't worked. This works. What a sacrifice of my vanity I have to make, you have to make. 
sacrifice of wanting to be someone, of wanting to be noticed, of wanting to say to myself and to you, look what I accomplished, look what I did. When you do that, you're creating your own fire. You don't do a thing. Even the desire you had to make a lot of money, which preceded the making a lot of money, was not you at all. You're not your desire to make a lot of money. Because that is a part. Desire to maintain ourselves physically on this, in this physical world is fine. But to put an eye into it to say, see how successful I am is quite another thing. And it will always be a fearful thing on the other side of it. So total defeat is the way out. Defeat of egotism. Of saying, I'm not going to be influenced by you anymore. I'm not going to be, take your word for anything anymore. I'm going to find out. Which means I have to go through the stage of utter confusion. Because in the state of utter confusion, I can begin to understand what confusion is. You know what confusion is? Confusion is the succession of one contradictory thought after another connected with my sense of self. stream of thoughts, each one telling me who I am, but oddly, oddly, and shockingly, they tell me opposite things. I'm a very moral person. Boy, and I see that beautiful woman, and I lust after her. I'm a very immoral person. I'm a very, uh, I'm kind, I'm a good man. I, I take good care of my family. Sure you do financially. The children have plenty of food and a roof over the head and your wife uh, gets a new winter coat when she needs it. You take good care of your family. Yeah, but boy, when I blew up at her the other day, that's good. All ideas about myself must be contradictory because they're not me at all. They're on the level of thoughts which always are contradictory, which always are opposite. That is what confusion is. Why don't you give up being either good, a good man or a bad man? Give up both. You give up the succession of contradictory thoughts. Then you will know who you are, but it is not thought telling you. It is a state without thinking, without label, without description. That is who you are, and it's not separate from this man and this man. Therefore, to be nothing is to be everything be nothing is to be everything I need to be. I don't need to be anyone. That has only made me neurotic and afraid. But I can't say I'm going to be no one. I have to drop the thought altogether. So there's not even the thought I am no one. Because if you say I'm no one, now you're still someone. For me to appear correctly I have to dis first disappear. If I die, I live. To die is to live. And it's still question time. We discuss the relationship between consciousness and conscience. Consciousness and conscience, they're the same thing, are they not? All right, now switch it back the other way. Remember a week ago in Boulder City, we said, the devil doesn't know he's a devil. All right, I'll repeat. The devil doesn't know he's a devil. Do you see how this connects with what you said? When I am arrogant, because I have happened to get, have human level authority in some way, the boss, or some kind of an official where I have authority over other people and I'm arrogant because I know you can't strike back 
if you try to strike back, I've got authority to put you in jail or to fine you or whatever. Arrogance is an unconscious state. And it feeds my false sense of self because there's a great thrill in having power over other people. And I will add, before we go any further, the wish and the pleasure to have authority over other people is sickness. If you want authority over anyone, there is something seriously wrong with you. And if you get pleasure out of it, you are unconscious and therefore you have no conscience. Have you ever been arrogant toward another person in the past and hurt them because you were arrogant? At that moment you had no conscience and you didn't have one at any other moment either. Simply because the opportunity to be cruel didn't come up. That's the that's ninety percent of the reason you don't see more cruelty and arrogance in this world, because people don't have the opportunity to be. This is why I tell you, when you get off in Afghanistan, that, then I'll watch your behavior when you're out there and no one's watching. That is the kind of person you really are, you know, not here. You're very saintly here. You quote Mark saintly. So, only truth, God, has a conscience. Which means, which means which means effortless goodness. Have you ever noticed how hard it is to be good? Huh? How difficult it is to be good? Of course it is. Because real goodness has no effort in it at all. Can you imagine God making an effort to be good, to be decent? Can you imagine truth? going around anxiously wondering whether this is the good thing to do or that the good thing that isn't goodness at all that's thought <coughs> so you can't try to be good at all what you can do is understand all these things so that there's no maker of effort to be good which is goodness which is the kingdom of heaven within expressing itself inwardly and then projecting itself outwardly toward other people so that you don't pounce in even the smallest way on another person think back if maybe the last week all of you where you had uh, some business experience some social experience maybe talking with a relative or something and notice a little byplay of how people who have no conscience at all will leap on every any opportunity to either promote or protect themselves that is lack of conscience or maybe we did it ourselves during the last week just a little remark an expression of the face wouldn't it be nicer just to be effortlessly good without wasting all that energy trying to be good it, 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 we've never it, we've never succeeded, have we? Trying to be good, have we? We wanted. To, do you remember? Do you remember that time when you'd get angry all the time and you'd hurt your wife or your husband or your children or someone else? Remember? And you made up your mind that I'm I'm not going to be angry. You, you felt guilty about it after. Remember? You felt guilty, and so you came over and smiled and apologized and said, "Come have a cup of coffee with me." And you said, from now on, I'm not going to do that anymore. But you kept doing it anymore because you couldn't help yourself. Right? You couldn't help yourself at all. And we never will as long as we don't understand these things because the old nature, the old mechanical man can't be good. All we can do is understand these things in order to die to the effort to be good. It's the only thing in the world that's going to change me and you from being cruel to other people. It's the only thing that's going to keep us from lying to them. The only thing that's keep us from doing things that we later regret and feel ashamed over. This, 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 this here is what breaks the pattern we have been trying to break all our life and have never succeeded in doing. This will do it. I guarantee you. And nothing else will.
Has anything ever worked for you, Juan, up till now? I know this. I'm not leading him an answer, but I know. I know he's tried everything. Nothing's worked. How about it, Larry? <sighs> Aren't you glad that it actually exists? The way out does exist. We, we didn't believe it did, did we? We didn't believe that it existed. How lucky we are. <sighs> I, don't, I don't know how we could be so lucky. to get the opportunity to stop being insane. Don't use soft words, use strong words. I mean, to tell me that that violence toward that person is anything but insanity, madness, viciousness. Aren't you glad that that can be shattered once and for all? Conscience and love, then, are clearly the same thing what we're talking about. It's apparent to me that a place where many of us experience confusion in this area is in trying to distinguish or clarify our psychological response to a situation and let's say the everyday practical situation. For example, we find ourselves Let's say that I find you in a situation of financial distress. Mm. You have a $10,000 asset, but you're willing to unload it at the moment for $5,000. I rush in and swoop it up knowing full well that two weeks later it will be worth $15,000, let us say. Okay. okay. The reason that we experience confusion, it seems, <clears throat> on this level is that somehow we sense that we separately have some responsibility for the practical setting, which we don't. Oh yes, and, and the greed of piling up more money and all that. Yeah. Let me give you a little something to think about right now, which connects with what you're talking about. Uh, can you look back to a year ago or five years ago to where if you had made a certain financial investment or had made a certain purchase or had moved in a certain way financially that you would have, to put it bluntly, you would have cleaned up on it, you would have made a lot of money. Can you think back of where if you had gone left instead of right, if you had said yes instead of no to a certain investment, where you could have made, can you think of that? I want, you to, I want you to think of it, because you probably all can. You got it? You got it? Ooh, if I, if I just bought that house, it doubled in, in two years. You got it? All right? <coughs> now, now, there's a perfect example of what a slave you are. Now, if you're real honest, and you look at this missed opportunity, as you thought of it right now, you would have seen a certain pain there. Right? Huh? The hand usually goes, oh, if I do. I'm telling you, you're a slave to that and to a thousand other things. What? Don't you know what slavery is? Slavery is attachment to the past of five minutes ago or ten years ago. Are you able to walk past that house you could have bought for 10000 and sold for 20,000 six months later, can you walk back by, by that house and see the pain going through you and then learn what it means to drop identification with that house and thereby drop pain? You can't do it until you see the whole false process that even the thought of profit, of financial profit, or the opposite, its pain, is a wrong process. Maybe you don't understand what a, a wonderful and powerful thing this is. And the reason you don't is because you walk by that house every day and suffer unconsciously because you walk by and the little part of your mind looks at it and you go into pain, but you don't know it because you're thinking about, I better be to work at 8 o'clock. Do you see how necessary it is to descend into the hell, oh, if I, oh. And 
then go to work on that hell. Don't you see what a wonderful thing this is? See, you don't even know how you suffer. I told you that. And that is one example out of a thousand you could get. Remember that girlfriend you could have had? Men? You could have gone to bed with her? And you're still suffering from that 20 years ago? See what slaves you are? You don't even know it. But she's back in your mind somewhere. Remember what pretty black hair she had? Huh? See what slaves you are? or watching a market, which is a way to make a living. All right? Two months ago, I had knowledge of what was happening to pennies, copper pennies, through our mints. And just yesterday, I went to two banks in our city to buy mint bags of pennies, $50 bag of pennies. Reason being, I speculate in six months they will double. That's a hundred percent profit. All right? That's fine. It's money. Yet, in going to one bank, I watched the supposed authority, a young girl hired in the, on the job, parrot the boss. All right? I know she's parroting the boss. But I my words, I bleed her a little bit with my psychological double talk, and I find an answer. The other bank's got a $50 mint bag. The other bank man is a personal business friend. I go up there and I try to coerce him to sell me that bag. All right? At a moment ago, I said, Why? Why did I do that? I did it in order to impress people in this town. Larry could get the pennies to impress our son, to impress his coin collecting okay. friend. Larry could get it. All right, all right. But it was impressionism. Yeah, all you right, all money? right. Okay, this is the way we live. And Larry, don't forget. Don't forget how you're trying to impress Larry. You impress your own image as of being a pretty sharp operator out there in that business world, right? Yes. This is what you're trying to impress yes. also as well as outwardly, right? Huh? Why did you get? Why did you give up that image of being a sharp trader, a sharp businessman? It's hard. It's hard. Huh? It's I know it is. I know it's it's hard. But do it. Do it anyway. Yes. Uh, a while back, when I wrote down this sentence. I think it ties into what you just said to Larry. If we could keep I out of all that we out of all that we do, this would lead us to. Right, right. I being thought. I is thought. When I know how to end thought, I end I. And I end all my identifications, my attachments, my labels. Then, then do I have a problem when I no longer exist as a label person? Where's the problem? Where's the person who's going to suffer if you leave me? There's no one there to suffer. But I love the suffering because even that keeps me in place, so I think. It keeps my label in place. Do you see how suffering becomes impossible? But you give, you try to give it up. You, you try to give up your pains and see how the devil will battle for them all the time, how you want to keep them. Because you suspect if you give up your suffering, the game will end. The game of being you. You, the sufferer, beware of people who have ideas of being persecuted. And how about being a, be wearing of ourselves and having these ideas of being persecuted? That is I again. I am persecuted by you. 
by society. Feelings of persecution is egotism and violence. Feelings of persecution is egotism and violence. I don't care who you are. And a person who feels persecuted will persecute anyone else at the first opportunity. When you see someone crying, you're looking at a violent human being. If you see yourself crying, you're looking at a violent human being. Beware of yourself when you cry. You're building your hell. You're lighting more fires, and you, or I, have to live in that fire. What we call fire, heaven. Try to see the difference between heaven and hell internally. But you have to see hell first. Then you don't see heaven, but you are heaven. Right? You don't see it. You are it. If you see heaven, then it'll always have to be a future heaven which is in thought. When I die, the man thinks, because I've been a good Christian, a good father, a good mother, then God will give me my just reward up there. It isn't an odd situation. Here's a person loaded with this violence we're talking about and this trickery and this hypocrisy. And he says, if I change my physical location from here to there, that will be heaven. Don't you understand? I, I am it. I am the hell. I am the heaven. Therefore, walking from here to there physically can't change that state because I'm always that state wherever I go. So see the falsity of saying, if I am good, which we're not anyway, then when I die, I'll go to heaven, and I'll be happy. My state, my state right now, this morning, your state right now, is your heaven or your hell. Do you understand that when you say God, you're saying a false thing? What is God? wrongly, God is a word. God is no word. That's a word. Is God a word? You write God on a piece of paper. Is that God? That's a piece of paper. That is division, because I say God will save me. When I stop saying, listen, listen, listen. When I stop saying, when I stop saying, God will save me, and understand what I'm saying, God saves me. Because I haven't created a false God out of my own images of what God is like. Therefore, the false God goes, then what is left is real God, the whole thing. But the appearance of God will come with the disappearance of me. Me, the terrible sinner, I'll pray to Christ, Christ, Forgive me my sins. He shed his blood for me. Christ saved me from my sins. Now I...